Okay, so I've started uh, recording the meeting. We can go whenever uh, we feel we're ready. Beth, is uh, Sam joining us? Hi, hi Keith. Yeah, Sam's sitting right here with me. Hello. Um, maybe we should just wait a couple minutes. Um, yeah, yeah. I, we, got, I, we got a few. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say we have a couple minutes. Yeah. Yeah, but it would be great. I don't recognize all the names of our participants. Maybe everyone um, could type in the chat and just let us know where they're from.
Is everyone ready to get started? Keith, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think okay. we can start any time. Okay, great. Um, this is Beth and Sam from PACE, and we just thank you to everyone for joining us today. It's great to see such an international crew uh, attend these meetings. It's really terrific. And we're going to start today with Christina bringing us some news about the latest version of Mahara. And I'm really interested in hearing what Christina is going to share and just be curious to hear kind of what versions people are currently on and kind of what people's upgrade schedule schedules are. So perhaps people can share some of that in the chat area while, while Christina is speaking. So we'll turn it over to Christina. Thank you very much, Beth. And um, also welcome for me from New Zealand. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are in the world. And today we seem to have a bigger crowd from Europe, which is also fantastic. And um, since we have a really, really big agenda, I thought that, um, that I'll just take a few minutes uh, to tell you a little bit about the, some of the new features in Mahara 1.7. And uh, then we, we can take questions or also, um, if there is time at the end, also potentially kind of look at some of them in an environment. But since I know that um, Adobe is usually, or yeah, screen sharing usually has some lag time, and especially to New Zealand, then I thought I better just um, have some slides um, to show you some of the features very briefly and um, share what we have done over the last few months. Okay, one of the biggest, uh, yeah, one of the most thought after features is kind of the one, the renaming of the share and shared pages and actually bringing everything together under the portfolio tab or under the portfolio um, menu item. So that um, share, when you are in your um, personal portfolio, is not anymore share but shared by me. And now you need to look for the shared pages, not anymore in the group tab but also under portfolio, and there you'll see shared with me. Um, that is something that um, we, we discussed in the community forums, and apparently when we had shared pages under groups, people didn't really find it. And so Dirk Meyer and also Don Present, I believe it was, that discussed it quite a bit, and that's uh, what we came then up with um, upon Dirk's uh, suggestion. And I hope that will be easier for people kind of to find things that they have shared themselves and things that have been shared with them. Um, a second big feature, uh, which came um, from the Edu1 project over in Australia, is that all artifacts can now have a license attached to them. So the site administrator can uh, define licenses. There are already um, all Creative Commons licenses predefined, but the, um, you can also add as many other um, licenses as you wish. And then users can start using these licenses on journal entries, on files, on text boxes, um, on plans, and also on the resume. Currently, we only display the license information on the details page of an artifact once it's been um, integrated in a page. But in the future, it can be that you also make that license information available on a page itself. And what is also quite nice is that we implemented it so it works with uh, institutions as well. And that means that institutions can require their users to attach a license to files because the site administrator can only say, yes, you can use licenses, but institutions can say, yes, you have to. And uh, they can also predetermine a default license for their institution. Um, but of course, since we, we also need to take individual users into account, um, users can override that setting in their account settings page and can choose their own default license. But since um, you need to, or sometimes people do upload um, items of diff which have different license types attached to them, and therefore on each artifact that you upload or that you create, can you choose a different license uh, from your regular one? Another big feature that came out of the Edu1 project is uh, for masquerading. And um, Ralf Hürgenstock had filed a bug some time ago about that to make masquerading uh, more transparent to the user um, so that they actually know when an administrator logged in is them. And now we've um, started implementing that feature, and that means 
that a site administrator can turn on that um, mask trading sessions are being locked. And also um, that the administrator needs to provide a reason. And then a third setting is also that the administrator could um, require that all users are being notified of the masquerading sessions. And that is quite neat because that way masquerading becomes more transparent to users. They know when an administrator logged in. And also for administrative purposes, for accountability, is it being locked on the server end? And there's also an administrator interface. Um, which makes it possible um, to follow up when masquerading sessions have been um, yeah have been set. And Ziggy, yes, you're right. Um, that is an important step for data protection. Um, what we have not yet implemented is that everything is being logged that the administrator does. We do have more logging going on, and logging needs to be turned on from at least for masquerading. And so a number of events are definitely be, being logged. Um, and that is something that um, we'll have to see how much that influences the database and whether things need to be taken out at some point. Because when you lock something and you do quite a bit on the, in the environment, then that table can get quite long and might have to be cleared out and archived separately later on. Um, another feature which you can already see on mahara.org when you go to the partners page are the so-called retractable blocks. And that means that you now have the possibility to hide the content of a block on a page. And then only when a user clicks on it, is it being expanded. So initially, you can make it so that you only see the heading of the bibliography, for example. Um, that is especially nice when you have a really, really long block. And only when the user says, yes, I really want to look at the bibliography, can they click on the um, it's on the icon on the right hand side and then it is being expanded so that you can see the entire content. Um, and one feature um, that Messi University here in New Zealand wanted us to implement is that filter by login date. Um, because especially when you have a large institution, you, you might want to find out quickly who is actually using Mahara. Uh, who has never logged in, who might we have to chase up for portfolio work and so on. And so we've um, included that login date filter. And now you can search for any user who has never logged in, who has not logged in since a specific date, or who have logged in since a specific date. And uh, that way you can kind of see a little bit better also the, um, the, the use of your Mahara instance and also um, might, you might be able to talk to uh, some of the students then if they are supposed to keep their portfolio but really haven't logged in to find out what the reasons were. There are a number of other features that we've also implemented in Mahara 1.7, um, a bit on the smaller side. And um, in altogether, we also had 20 commits from the students of our open source academy, which is fantastic. And one student even implemented a feature that um, makes it configurable for uh, site administrators to decide how long that registration period is uh, until when uh, users need to be informed about their pending registrations and whether they are allowed to have an account. Um, and then we also had some other uh, smaller features that uh, you can read up on in the manual when you go to the index and then scroll down or click on the end and look at uh, new in Mahara 1.7 and to all these features. And of course, you can also try out all, um, all the features um, on our demo site and um, just play with them and see whether you would like to have them. Now, in terms of Mahara 1.8, um, that um, we are, of course, already working on that. And Mahara 1.8 will be a bigger release than Mahara 1.7, um, simply because we are already working on some very big features. And not all of them have been entirely confirmed yet, because currently we are doing um, development work for the Ministry of Education. 
And so we, we are still in de deciding which features eventually to fully implement. But one of the features that we've been working on is uh, full text search, which is, um, of course, a fantastic feature to implement uh, since a lot of people have been asking about it for, for quite some time. And so we are in the very fortunate position to implement that. Um, however, it will not be possible for everyone to use it because um, you will need an extra server for it um, since a, a separate search engine is necessary to work with it. But um, especially larger Mahara instances uh, can benefit very much from it and have everything indexed um, for everything that is being put into the environment. And what we are currently leaving out is um, full text search of documents, so the content of PDF documents, but everything else, all the metadata and also uh, text blocks and journal entries and so on, uh, they will be searched in complete full text and then displayed. This is an enormous feature to work on and um, because the permissions in Mahara are really, really complex and complicated and also making it uh, so that all relevant information is displayed but also not too much and then also that you have faceted search and can drill down into your search results more easily is quite a big task and so we are hard working on getting that right. And once it is in code for view, of course, uh, like with any other feature or bug fix in Mahara, you are very welcome to, um, to test it out and also give us feedback on it. Um, just going briefly back to uh, Sigi's question about the retractable blocks, um, they also work with block entries. They work with every block on Mahara uh, that you can put into a, into a page. So you can really hide and make visible anything that you can put on a page because it's a block setting itself. Okay, that um, was pretty much some of the features that I wanted to share with you um, very, very briefly um, because we have a full agenda today. And if you have any other questions about them, please um, feel free to contact me or also use the forums on mahara.org. If you aren't already registered, you can register on mahara.org org and be immediately registered also for the community forums or the, the community space. And then you can ask uh, questions and we will we'll also answer and help you with your instance there. Okay, over to Beth or Keith, I think. Uh, actually, Christina, thanks. We'll we'll go to uh, Garrett next. Uh, so I'll stop sharing yours and let me pull up my screen for Garrett. And okay, Garrett, um, all about badges. Okay, um, Keith, just checking that you can hear me okay again. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, can can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yes, you're, you're coming through fine, Garrett. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, hello everyone. Um, so I hope you're enjoying the weather where you are. It's a beautiful 70 degrees in Connecticut right now, really enjoying life. Um, and I, I want to uh, speak to you about badges today and really kind of shift focus not only to what's going on with Mahara as Christina did, but kind of our role as the Mahara user group and speak a little bit a little bit about that. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about my understanding of badges and then um, talk about how I how I think we can we can help or just kind of encourage the badge um, revolution out there. Um, and talk about kind of s some problems, contingencies, um, semantics that I think would um, we would need to consider if we go forward with this, but then um, finish off with a what's in it for us type question and then of course get your thoughts on it too um, because 
Um, it, it was a thought, but I think we would all need to kind of agree on how to go forward with it if we decide to do this at all. So anyway, um, Mozilla is probably one of the larger um, proponents of badges out there. And if you just see the short description that Keith brought up here on what a badge is, it says it's a digital record of skills, achievements, and participation, and so forth. And, you know, um, in a way, ePortfolio has been doing this, but of course, as a society, we just kind of love to see little icons that show that we've excelled in certain things. And so that's why these things are called badges. And if you scroll down just a little bit, Keith, um, people could get a sense of what the icons look like and um, for what types of skills people would receive these for. And um, the idea is that there would be a little bit more of a symbiotic relationship between these badges and an ePortfolio system like what we have. So for example, um, someone would earn a badge out there from a, a badge granting entity like, um, I don't know, like Mozilla or a place of employment or whatever, and then display these icons in an ePortfolio, which is just an awesome idea. I think, um, my original thought was this, that is that we're in a great position to um, award these symbols of merit to either, I guess we would need to decide on the audience, but either other institutions or to individuals. And of course, that seems like a huge task to, for MUG to award it to individuals, but I guess we'd need to decide on that. I think, though, that um, we have things like assessment toolkits. Um, we have things like, um, uh, like aesthetic positions on how uh, pages should look and perspectives on how pages reach student learning outcomes that we're in a good position to do that because we could kind of put our minds together and figure out you know, um, wh what makes a good portfolio, I guess is the good question. And so um, we could say um, that um, we can award badges, let's say, for excellence in portfolio composition and that at the time of review, um, and I put an asterisk by that because we would need to kind of put a timestamp on it, at the time of review, the portfolio demonstrates excellence, say, in composition of pages or visual appeal or that it contains pertinent, substantive, reflective content indicating a learner transformation or that it indicates professional development or all of these things. Um, but as I said before, there's an issue with semantics. So we would, uh, one problem or obstacle would be how do we um, agree upon a rubric for those things, and um, and I know people love to hear that word rubric, right? Um, but that would kind of take some time to agree on that, so that we put our stamp of approval on these things. So I don't even know if anyone would even want to be involved in that process. But it's a learning experience. I think some things would come to light as we uh, design this rubric and agree on you know what makes a good portfolio and and award a badge for it. So there's a chance that you know, putting this kind of rubric or, uh, I don't know, uh, system together, um, we would learn something that might not have been revealed before. So that's good. Um, so I, I guess in a minute, I want to ask you how you feel about um, either awarding this to institutions or individuals. Um, my, uh, uh, I, I guess the thing that I want to say about the technology itself it does not look difficult to do. We would just kind of create um, a workflow that would just kind of um, ask people to submit a portion of their portfolio to us, and then we can we can find a way to just kind of disperse that badge out. So that's kind of secondary to the idea of um, how do we review this and agree on things. Um, I wanted to end with, um, of course, that question about individuals or institutions, but also say, you know, what's in it for us? And so I think it could do two main things for us. Um, I think it would I think it would boost our image as a group um, and help us out. And we can use this as a way to transition um, for uh, I, I don't know toward a toward a um, a grant receiving entity. You know, so if we need the resources to uh, look over all these portfolios that could be our open door to ask for grant money to do this because we're doing a good thing. Um, so it kind of boosts our image and allows us to receive grants um, at some point, possibly. 
And then secondly, um, we're learning and seeing how others are using it and opening it up to a larger community, perhaps even outside of academia. So we're advancing our own understanding of it, and it keeps us current with it. Um, and we can kind of receive more of these uh, portfolios and, and, and award them. So I think that's a good thing. So uh, that's my thought on it. To be honest, I haven't done this just yet. I, I haven't received you know, advanced badges, nor does my school kind of um, do that right now. But I wanted to open up the floor for thoughts on it. And I guess maybe first start with what does everyone think about it? Um, or sh should we start by helping out institutions, perhaps even each other, um, or move over to individuals? Okay, so anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, Gil, can you hear me? Uh. I could hear you, Keith. Okay. Okay, so someone said, you know, um, this issue has come up before about U Mahara user certification, and yeah, perhaps this can help. I, I think it can um, it can help with not only demonstrating the skill, but also, you know, kind of say you know, what's a good substantive area in which these things can be done. What's a good demonstration of it? You know, the evidence. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah. Beth, I'm not sure how we would award institutions, individuals. Okay. And to be honest, in, in my in my view, I think awarding individuals seems much cooler too, and it <laughs> it seems like a very political thing to award it to other institutions. But um, yeah, I wasn't sure how people felt about that. But um, yeah, okay. Right. Okay, Christina. Thanks for the clarification there. They are for individuals. Okay. Yep. Um, maybe just very briefly, we definitely and about... Siggy awarding for individuals makes more sense as Mahara for individuals anyway. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I think they're, it's pretty close to unanimous here. And I guess when I was kind of thinking this through in my mind, I, I, I didn't know um, which way to go with that. Celebrate institute. Yes, Beth. Great idea. We need to be celebrated a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, we are an institution that has that has given away, let's say, 20 badges in um, ePortfolio slash Mahara proficiency. That's excellent. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Garrett. Even something that okay, would so seem like a um, great ideas out there. I, I don't know. You know, if we if we do move forward with um, awarding this to to individuals, um, I guess we would start with kind of like a, a broad brushstroke of of what are the things we look for in a portfolio. And I don't know if that list before I mentioned makes sense, but I just kind of thought you know composition of pages, visual appeal, substantive content, providing evidence of transformation, and professional development. Um, you know, I can I could start by typing this out and perhaps posting this in our group with, with Sam's help as a document there, and then anyone can contribute to it if you're interested. Um, yeah, Beth, um, a list of categories for badges. That's a cool idea, too. So there could be different badge tracks, um, a badge for XYZ. Yeah. Great. Okay, so it sounds like um, it sounds like most folks are interested in it, which is good. Um, and I, I could just once the semester ends, of course, I think I'll just kind of type something up and and post it in our group, and hopefully we can get something going. I'm glad to have the help of the eterns too, Beth. That would just be awesome because <laughs> um, resources is an issue. But you know, I, I think the hope has been from the start that this Mahara user group could at some point receive um, grants for doing certain things, and this might be our in with that. So 
um, hopefully we can we can move forward and just kind of um, prove that we're doing good work because I think we are we we do a lot of um, a lot of work and this would be our opportunity to view work from others and give our stamp of approval on it and move forward with our own image at the same time so um, thank you all and I'll try to get all these things together for everyone later yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Garrett. So, okay, good. I'm going to make sure my microphone is back on. I guess I'm up next. <coughs> so, what I want to talk a little bit about is how we're providing some uh, Mahara services for other SUNY campuses. Um, so just briefly, uh, we've been mostly working on Moodle for the last uh, four years or so, uh, and, and that's where a lot of our effort has been developed. We're really just getting started still, although we're we're still working on getting some traction on on developing a portfolio, um, a, a a culture of of e-portfolios on campus here. So um, these are just some slides I presented at a previous mug meeting. Uh, we're very interested in the relationship we can have between our Moodle system as the LMS, all built around courses, and how our students can eventually use Mahara to, of course capture work from the LMS and build up a you know a portfolio of evidence of, about their about their learning and this is the the story that we've been uh, uh, talking about how to use these open applications around SUNY for for a while uh, given that we've had um, some interest in other student campuses uh, coming to us to for advice or for actually um, various kinds of services. This is a, a very hot topic uh, as far as SUNY is concerned right now. Um, many of you probably don't know a lot about SUNY, but it's the State University of New York system. There are 64 campuses. And there is a big push right now to be more intentional about sharing services among the campuses. Uh, and so we're hoping to, to try to play into that initiative that uh, is very important um, for the central system administration. So as I said, we have been an advocate of a variety of applications around SUNY, uh, Moodle, Mahara. We have our Moodle and Mahara um, combined together into the Mahoodle kind of integration. We've got other open uh, applications as well. And we've had some experience doing some very small scale Moodle hosting for other SUNY campuses. And I won't bother going through through the details of those given our agenda today. But the questions come up, well, since we have are developing this experience, at least running Mahara, and, and working with these open applications, um, perhaps there's some opportunities for us to provide services in terms of hosting e-portfolios for different campuses. So I just want to go into a couple of the projects we've been working on. And I thought I would show some screenshots of the actual um, administrative end of this, how this, this integration actually works, and what some of the opportunities are. So our, our, uh, the first one I want to talk about is a small pilot project that we have been doing for the last uh, probably year or so with Empire State College. They uh, make uh, extensive use of e-portfolios in their degree completion programs. Empire State works a lot with returning students coming up with an educational plan um, that will work those students through uh, you know a series of steps to meet their degree needs, and um, with with Ellen uh, Murphy joining Empire State, there's a, a you know big interest in using um, Mahara and, and Moodle for um, 
for these kinds of purposes. Well, we agreed about a year ago to provide some, some temporary Mahara hosting uh, as they were going through a transition moving to Moodle rooms. And so on our Mahara system, because it supports multiple institutions, we were able to set up a separate institution for Empire State. And uh, in the case of this small pilot project, we essentially set up uh, a number of internal accounts on the Mahara system itself. These are all manually managed and set up a few of their staff as admins onto their um, uh, institution on Mahara, on our Mahara. And then their admin admins could basically manage the account creation and uh, provide support for their users within the Empire State um, institution that we set up on our on our Mahara, and basically they have the ability to upload through um, through a CSV file, just a plain text file, the account information for the accounts that they need, and um, have been basically making use of our of our server for for this program um, just for those of you who are Mahara um, admins I thought I would go through and um, um, just briefly go through the steps so uh, if you go into the admin dashboard for the Mahara system there is a There is uh, an option to set up multiple institutions. What that looks like is, um, is this. On our system, we basically have our uh, institution for Purchase College. All of our uh, users can log in directly to Mahara, or we've also got it set up for single sign-on from our Moodle system. So from Moodle, users can go uh, directly into Mahara. If you click on the Add Institution button, you basically can define multiple institutions on your one single server. So uh, you know, provide a name. Um, for all of the institutions we've set up, we have not allowed self-registration because we want to control who is uh, you know, being added to these systems. And so, uh, as we'll see in a minute, we basically unselect the self-registration functionality. We've not been very, uh, we've not gotten very crazy in, in about this, but um, you know, in general, these separate institutions can rely on different themes for differentiation, have different logos, and so forth. So these are some of the features we haven't yet really even looked into, but um, you know. Through that mechanism, we've set up this Empire State uh, institution. We're essentially supporting 114 of their users. And um, given that we can set up some of their um, people as admins for their institution, it's been a very uh, easy thing for us to do. Really not much, not much of a service load on our end. Um, so again, as I said, these are all internal accounts that were, were set up uh, through a bulk upload of um, by the Empire State admins of the user information for, um, for their accounts. So that's been a very, um, a very nice way to, to start looking at these shared um, services between the uh, between our different campuses again as I've as I mentioned we've set up a number of them as um, admins and essentially it's very straightforward you create your CSV file that has all the user information specify what uh, institution these are going to be uploaded into uh, as admins of their institution they can just uh, add people to their institution and um, that's been a very seamless process for them uh, we have a little bit more of a full featured relationship with SUNY Delhi that uh, we're just working on this semester they're also a Moodle campus uh, how do you handle users leaving an institution? Um, they can, if they are if they are internal accounts, Siggy, um, 
yeah, there's no reason why the um, the accounts can't remain as their internal accounts on the Mahara system. Again, we don't have for the for the Empire State users, they have no accounts with us, so it really doesn't matter from our perspective whether they're at Empire State or not. Um, and from since uh, Empire State is uploading them as internal accounts, then really it's not tied into their um, their LDAP or uh, authentication at all. So what we've done with Delhi is to uh, basically connect their Moodle LMS with our Mahara system to, to do a cross-campus Mahoodle um, integration. We essentially um, are using the trusted relationships between the two systems to allow them to single sign on from their Moodle into our Mahara. That's basically the first step. And then um, given uh, settings on Moodle to set up support for external ePortfolios, which I won't, I won't go through today, their students have the ability to export materials from their Moodle into our Mahara, into their accounts on our Mahara. And then, you know, the, the last step in closing that loop is their, the ability for their students to submit Mahara ePortfolios that they create on our server back to, Mo tap back to their Moodle for grading. Um, we're, we're just um, doing this on a small scale. Uh, we're focusing on a few uh, service learning classes at Delhi that we're interested in using ePortfolios. But because we've got the single sign-on, um, basically our ePortfolio service is available to any, any student or faculty member at Delhi once they log into their Moodle uh, account at, at Delhi. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, uh, Bill, about uh, transferring from one institution to the other on the same host. You, you can actually have um, accounts. Um, yeah, it's pretty. It's fairly straightforward, and I might have some of the back end screenshots to show that. Uh, so again, the the first step in this process is for their Moodle to talk to our Mahara, and for our our Mahara to treat their Moodle login as an authentication mechanism. And so uh, the uh, instead of relying on internal accounts. Um, you use the built-in XML RPC plugin with uh, Mahara to identify this external host that will be submitting authentication information. Um, what that setup looks like, it uh, of course involves sharing of public keys back and forth between the two servers. And um, in the case of Delhi, uh, we've basically got um, uh, their single sign-on coming in. So this single sign-on direction, I should use the pointer here, this single sign-on direction means that they SSO in, meaning their Moodle accounts provide the authentication to sign on into our Mahara server. Now, um, these authentication mechanisms can be um, arranged in the hierarchical arrangement. We have this kind of single sign-on between our Moodle and our Mahara as well. And so we would have, uh, and I should have got a screen capture of this, we would have on our Mahara this kind of um, authentication for our um, purchase institution on our Mahara system. But on our system, we've got it, the XM. P, um, you know, this single sign-on uh, set up as a child from our LDAP. So it doesn't matter whether um, our students sign in from um, Moodle or directly into Mahara using um, their, um, their purchase account. They're basically working with the same account. We've got it set up to update user information on login. 
we auto create users. So as soon as someone from Delhi Moodle clicks on the let's go to purchase Mahara, it auto creates a user account for them based on the um, authentication coming from Delhi and it lets them from their Moodle export content to be um, to be imported into their accounts on our Mahara system. Um, and with the version of uh, Mahara we're running, we can now see stats on what's going on. Um, again, 19, 915 of their users have logged into our Mahara system from their Moodle system and created accounts, but most of those haven't actually done anything. And so if you can see, uh, yeah, every time an account's created, two pages are are created by default, the profile page and the dashboard page, and we barely have more than twice as many user pages as users. So most of the users are popping in, taking a look and see what's going on, uh, but not really doing any um, ePortfolio work yet. But uh, as these courses take off, we expect that to, to increase. Um, and so, um, that is, um, you know, that's a very nice integration for, for them and for us. Uh, going forward, we plan to kind of promote this, this ability to use open applications to share services across different SUNY campuses. We're having continuing conversations with Empire State to do a more extensive hosting option for them. And again, they would like single sign-on. Um, they want to use uh, CAS authentication, and so we'll have to think about installing a plug-in on our system that will handle that for the Empire State um, uh, um, users, and basically have to think about switching over those manual accounts to use this CAS authentication method. So it's pretty straightforward, maybe a lot of uh, manual processing to get everything synced up. But uh, we're now going around, um, well, um, we've, we've extended offers to other campuses, other student campuses who are interested in Mahara ePortfolios to say, well, if you want to try things out, we can certainly um, you know, use, allow, allow you to use our system to at least pilot test and maybe even more um, your use of, of Mahara. So I haven't been um, following the chat too much, but uh, let me just see. Yeah, the parent author authority, that's, it was nice once we figured that out so that, um, so that we made sure that um, students had one account whether they came in through Moodle or logged in directly and once we once we figured that out it's very easy to apply that to the kinds of integrations we're doing with some of these other uh, SUNY campuses. Um, and yeah if you do a um, I think I had a link in the in the presentation, but if you do a, a search for Mahoodle integration, you'll come up with some very nice directions for setting up this MNet networking that will do the trust relationship between Moodle and Mahara. Um, what we're going to have to work on when we upgrade our Moodle from 2.2 to either 2.4 or 2.5 is that I think Moodle has changed its networking um, functionality. so. We'll have to make sure we don't break this Mahara, Mahoodle integration. Um, are we helping institutions with implementation in general? Well, SUNY as a whole has this task force that I'm on that is looking at what needs to be done across the system to promote ePortfolios. That's not application specific. In fact, we've been told specifically that we can't recommend one um, one application um, for system-wide adoption, but we are looking at what are what are the different SUNY campuses doing with ePortfolios. 
uh, what are the impediments that they are dealing with, and um, you know, what does SUNY as a whole need to do to promote uh, implementation and effective uh, effective implementations of ePortfolios across uh, across the system. Okay. I think that's that's what I've got. Um, so I don't know, Beth or Christina, if if uh, did I miss any questions in the chat? No, I think uh, I think you covered them, Keith. Thanks so much. Okay. So let me pull up yours. Okay. And I know. We're, thanks so much, Keith. And um, conversations here have been great. Well, I can go pretty quickly because um, I know we're short on time. Um, but I'm glad that Keith showed um, the SUNY Delhi uh, statistics page because that really ties into what I wanted to speak about. Um, uh, at Pace, we were really struggling with that statistics page in trying to get the kind of information that we wanted to out of Mahara. And I guess I'm curious to hear if other institutions have also had similar concerns. Um, basically, this is our problem, and maybe some of you, maybe this is your problem as well, but um, we're getting increasing amounts of demands from stakeholders and key administrators for real specific user data. And there's a need for us to be able to break down um, the usage, uh, not just to be able to talk in broad numbers about numbers of people that have logged in, but be able to identify their school or college, their user type, their level of undergrad or grad, and even get down to the department or course level. So this has been a challenge, and even though we're pleased that Mahara has been coming along with the statistics page that it now has, um, I still feel like it's um, somewhat limited and just curious of any institutions. Yeah, because I know it's a lot of reporting. I know. We got, we're, we're big on numbers here at PACE. And, um, and it's not just for PACE. I mean, it's also for some grant work that we've been involved in. And, it's a resource issue, too. I mean, to continue our staffing, to keep up our students, um, we need to be able to document usage beyond just saying, well, oh, ePortfolios is really catching on. So um, thankfully, our expert team of programmers, some of whom are on this call, um, have been working with us steadily to address this problem. And they have um, created um, some real customized reporting that just can show you quickly to get give you an idea um, that we really want to be able to report out monthly uh, not just numbers of users, but um, really get a sense of who's a robust user and who's an occasional user and the total number of hits per page and where this use is happening um, by school and college and by type of uh, student, undergrad or grad. I can just go through these quickly again. I know we don't have too much time, but um, we're still we're still developing this and still trying to make sense of the information that's there. And be real curious to hear from others if you have had the need to create reports like this and if anyone's been able to do it successfully. Um, we don't use um, Moodle. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're using Mahara as a standalone. And so that may impact what we're able to do or not able to do. Um, I see Christina's question, how do we distinguish users for reports? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question, but we, we're, we're trying to um, define users um, as robust or um, occasional so we can get a sense of, of those two groups um, so that we understand who's using it robustly and understand who's using it maybe occasionally or just once. So we could follow up with those users as well. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, and right now, we have all our users in one institution. Initially, we did have different institutions for our different um, colleges and universities, but we've since combined into one, and I think that's made it simpler for us. Um, I hope that answered that question. Um, we're looking at our total artifacts per user type, too, to try to get a sense of um, who's using what in terms of um, the different features. And again, trying to look at artifacts um, by institution, um, in other words, by college or school, and by um, some of our administrative departments as well. 
But I guess what I'd like to um, sort of end on, and you know, I, hopefully this conversation could be one that continues either through Facebook or through mahar.org or through our next uh, meeting. Um, but we're, you know, we're wondering how everyone here documents usage in ePortfolio. Um, do you document usage by a monthly view? Or are you looking at more cumulative um, views, for instance, for an academic year? Um, we're really trying to grapple with that. We're not sure what is the accurate way to do that. Someone may create a fantastic ePortfolio, very robust, lots of artifacts. But did it last month, it's still out there being viewed, but they haven't done any activity this month. And so we're just, um, we're just not sure how to, uh, how to always document that. And um, I guess we look forward to talking about this more with everybody. But I feel like maybe I should touch on some of the other items that we have on our agenda um, to make sure we get these last items in. Um, the other item that I was hoping to mention was um, kind of our plans for our next get-together. And I know we have such an international crowd today, which is wonderful. I'd be curious to know if um, anyone from the group is planning on attending ABLE in Boston in July, the big ePortfolio Summit here. Um, uh, we'll be there, and I think Christina might be there. And just wondering if it makes sense to try to plan something either at ABLE or before or after the conference, um, if there will be a group of us around. And if not, certainly we could continue to meet online like this um, because it's really a great way to reach everyone with the far distance. But the past couple of summers we've met face to face too, and I think that's been really nice for, for the group that can do it. So I see we have a few questions or comments. Perhaps people could respond to the chat if you, you know, have comments about that. And I think the other person we want to include in the agenda if she's still here, is Jasmine. Um, Jasmine had posted two suggestions to uh, the, our Mahara agenda. And if uh, I don't know if she has the power to have the mic, Keith, or not, but um, the two items were she, she does would like to see. OK, thanks. And also Mahara UK. So Jasmine, would you like to speak about either or both of those? Okay, maybe Jasmine is not available. Um, the other item that we wanted to speak about is last April we did a student showcase, and this kind of ties into what Garrett was talking about with the badges. Thinking about it now, it might have been nice if this group kind of awarded badges to some of those students who we um, recognized last April. Maybe that's something we could do going forward if we figure out an approach with the badges. Maybe we could tie it into another type of virtual student showcase. Are there any thoughts on that? <laughs> oh, hi, Jasmine. We were looking to turn it over to you for your two su suggested topics. If you wanted to uh, take the mic and speak to the group about changes you'd like to see in Mahara or uh, the Mahara UK item you mentioned. I see, Christina, if you want to speak about that, that's fine. Feel free. OK, so, oh, did, got to go uh, somewhere else. Oops. OK. Um, just got to go into a meeting room because everyone is um, suddenly coming in to work. Um, yeah, this year we'll actually have a number of um, Mahara um, events going on in Europe. And the first one will be in France uh, from the 5th to the 7th of June. Uh, that is the Mahara Mood and also Mood Mood. And then there is Mahara UK on the 3rd and 4th of July in Birmingham. And uh, this year also uh, for the first time we'll have Mahara DE, which will be on the 21st of September. So these are 
um, if you are in Europe or if you're planning on going to Europe uh, during any of these times, these are fantastic events just to catch up with other Mahara users and see what they are doing over in Europe. Oh, and also if you happen to be in the Southern Hemisphere, um, on the 8th of May we'll have a Mahara uh, Moodle Mahara Meetup in Adelaide. And um, at that point we'll definitely address some of the uh, some of the connecting things between Moodle and Mahara, how to go forward in the future, what would be good to have, um, also what might be in the making uh, on the Moodle side, for example, as well and um, just talk about more of these integration things. And as far as I know, at least the keynotes will be recorded. And so Alison Miller will, um, will then also make them available for everyone to listen to afterwards, which will be a great community resource for those who cannot attend. So Beth, I, uh, are we wrapped up then? Um, oh, uh, Nader, yes. Uh, the I made the recording. I'll, I'll stop it as soon as we're done. Uh, I've got a couple of things in Adobe Connect that I will need to do to. Uh, to make it available, but then once it's available, it will be, um, for example, posted um, in the Mahara user group uh, page on uh, on Facebook, and we can also you know tweet it out or or other um, other mechanisms to get it out. But yeah, it'll be it'll be made public probably um, uh, within a couple of days. Oh, you're welcome, Beth. <laughs> So yeah, thanks everyone, and uh, uh, it's been a great turnout this time. <laughs>